Good morning and welcome. My name is Brian Garrity. Uh, I'm pleased to welcome you all to our annual budget breakfast. Somewhat disappointed not to be welcoming you in, uh, welcoming you in person uh, to what uh, was um, the Jury's Hotel, D4 Hotel, where we traditionally held this annual event. I always look forward to the cooked breakfast on these mornings, but unfortunately you're going to have to cook your own breakfast this morning and hopefully we can get back there next year. We're delighted to have as our guest speaker this morning, the renowned economist Jim Power, who is a prolific commentator on our national finances and economic affairs. The running order this morning, which will be no more than an hour, uh, we'll start with a panel discussion with our own partners on the implications of the Budget 22 announcement yesterday and what we might expect the impact to be. I'll then introduce our guest speaker, Jim Power, and we'll finish off with a short Q&A uh, session where attendees will have an opportunity to pose questions to our panel and to Jim. We have with joining us now for the panel discussion uh, three partners from uh, Crow, and I'll give you a short uh, introduction to them. Uh, Lisa Kinsler is a partner in our tax department dealing with a variety of domestic, international, corporate and high work network clients. She advises on employment taxes, intellectual property taxation and company restructuring. Uh, Cormac Doyle is our newest taxation partner who joined us in the middle of the pandemic in June 2020 and probably has yet to spend more than three consecutive days in the office. Uh, he provides practical, strategic and commercial advice across a wide range of taxation areas, has extensive experience working with private clients and uh, clients of the financial services, technology and life science sectors. And then finally, uh, Aidan is a partner with our firm's corporate finance department. He also heads up our uh, hospitality sector and is responsible for publishing the annual hotel uh, uh, industry service, survey published by Crow, which serves as a benchmark for the sector and will give us, uh, give us his um, perspective uh, uh, from a business point of view on the budget implications. Let's begin the panel discussion. Lisa, can I start with you? Um, Lisa, I noticed some references to the debt warehousing provisions in the budget announcement. On the personal tax side, I have some uh, director clients asking me uh, that how they're not being allowed for the PAOIE credit in their tax computations. Does this annou announcement now fix that? Good morning, Brian. Um, yes, the announcement yesterday um, about the debt warehousing being extended to the uh, proprietary directors is very welcomed. Um, I think it's been well publicised over the last couple of months that uh, proprietary directors of companies who availed of debt warehousing could be adversely affected when they file their tax returns next month um, due to a long standing provision in Irish tax law. And I suppose just to give a little bit of context around that, Brian, uh, we have at the end of September 95,000 individual businesses uh, claiming debt warehousing and I think 1.2 billion of the PAYE uh, debt has been warehoused. So this is, you know, it's not a small issue. There's quite a lot of people impacted by it. And I suppose the background to the section in the legislation that we're discussing is that um, proprietary directors who have a salary from a company where the PAYE hasn't been paid um, would not get a credit for that PAYE. So when they would file their tax returns next month, they'd end up having um, a tax liability been triggered immediately on which uh, interest would become payable. And that just didn't really make sense, given that the, the company themselves were allowed to warehouse that debt and basically given a period of grace to pay that off. Um, so yesterday, uh, the minister announced that the debt warehousing would actually be extended out to the proprietary directors to effectively cover this liability. So they can park that for 2022, which would hopefully give the company time uh, to pay down that debt and with the with the director themselves not being negatively impacted. So I think it is it's it's very favorable, Brian. OK, and, and just as we mentioned, the debt warehousing, what's going to happen to all this warehouse tax? I mean, uh, I know the repayment date is, is pushed out to January 2023, but what's expected to happen then? So I suppose uh, Jan January 2023 is going to be uh, a stressful month for, for a lot of people. And again, just like looking back at the statistics, I think um, at this moment in time, we have 33 million of income tax being debt warehoused. And that just relates to people's balancing payments from 2019 and preliminary tax for 2020. Uh, this year, uh, certain individuals will also be allowed to warehouse their 2021 preliminary tax. Okay. So that, that's quite a lot of tax being, um, you know, being warehoused. Um, and it, I mean, it's, it's very advantageous in that these people won't have to pay this for the next year and they won't have any interest accruing on it. 
But come January 2023, um, under the current uh, guidelines and, and legislation, this will all become payable. Um, and what individuals will have to do is to enter into discussions with revenue um, to get um, personal you know, pay payment plans. Now, they will be afforded a reduced interest rate. But historically, revenue look for significant down payments being, say, 25 percent of the debt. Um, so I think, you know, people are really going to have to watch their cash flow next year. They will obviously have to be filing a tax return November next year with 2022 prelim. And then following that in the January, they're going to have to come up with a significant down payment. So yeah. really, we're encouraging people that they, you know, they need to be monitoring this. They cannot put it on the long finger. And um, we're really encouraging people to, to discuss it with us because we really do want to try and help people manage this, uh, these significant liabilities that are coming forward. Yeah. Okay. I, I, that's kind of an interesting one about the mm -hmm. the uh, the tax clearance. If you're looking for tax clearance, they they typically look for twenty five percent up front. So you could have a situation where you'd be holding back and, uh, rather than paying any spare cash you have in. Okay. Yeah. Absolutely. Uh, all right. But just in relation to that, Aidan, I might turn to you. Um, following on from 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 like the the warehouse tax uh, issue, what do you think uh, the tax uh, the impact of this will be with with the access to credit from the banks? What will the, will the bank's attitude be to 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 um, tax warehousing? Yeah, there there are huge sums of VAT and payroll taxes warehoused um, over the last kind of 12, 15 months. And I think what the banks will do is they will view that as being another loan or another funder, and one which has actually almost priority over um, the bank's uh, repayments in terms of you mentioned there the tax clearance certs, and also you know if revenue. Are so minded that they can apply attachment orders to bank accounts and sub cash out of a business. So I think you know banks will always look at what's the available cash flow uh, in terms of what loans they can make, and the available cash flow will be after um, allowing for the repayment plan or the expected repayment plan for the warehouse debt. So if we think about, I suppose, the warehouse debt being repaid over 24 months. 2023 and 2024, I think it's going to limit the borrowing capacity for a lot of businesses over those two years because the headroom won't be there in terms of taking on more bank debt. And I suppose then the question is, what's, that, what's the implication for you know, expansion and growth? So I, what, I, what we would be saying, obviously, to, to businesses would be, yes, this is a low cost form of borrowing in terms of the revenue are, are helping your cash flow and helping your working capital. But you know, if you're looking to do expansion or growth, um, your funding package for that in 2023 or 2024 may need to involve you know, uh, an amount that will actually repay the warehouse debt uh, as well as the funding required for the investment. And therefore, you're spreading, I suppose, the warehouse debt, debt cost over a longer period. Right. OK. And in turn, I presume that will probably reduce your, your, your uh, borrowing capacity um if if the repayments are being uh, allocated to other um uh, commitments but uh you work a lot with the hospit hospitality sector and i note the minimum wage has, has gone up to 1050 this year there's also a kind of an offset in that there's an extension of the employment wage sub subsidy until april 2022 uh with the payouts tapered in in december and then in next uh, march do you think the hospitality sector is in a position now to stand on its own two feet by next easter yeah, I think the well, the employment uh, wage support scheme has been hugely important to the hospitality sector, and really, it's been the survival tool for them in terms of their, their turnover being so decimated when you know, they were closed for so long. Uh, they had the reopening issues, and then they had obviously uh, a lack of international travel. Um, all of those things will continue on into 2022. So, I think it's going to be very, very difficult next year because. Um, you know, the hospitality sector is going to be hit, I suppose, with, with a series of, of issues. So take it from January, they're on full rates. Um, from February, they have got to pay all of that and PAYE as it falls due because there's no more warehousing. The employment wage support scheme is being reduced probably by two thirds in terms of its impact for February and March. They're on full employers PRSI from the 1st of May. And the VAT is going back up to 13.5% from 1 September. So all of these things, one after the other, 
are going to impact, I suppose, the cash flow of hotels. And my fear, I suppose, is that, you know, it's a bit like, I suppose, the straw that, that breaks the camel's back. But, you know, too much happening in one year um, and not giving, I suppose, that extra six months or, or a year for the, the, the hotels that might be you know, struggling most to recover to pre-COVID levels. Um, you know, I think there'll be a price to be paid for that. And I think it'll, it'll force hotel owner, owners or some hotel owners to actually have to sell their businesses at the end of 2022 um, in order to deal with the debts. And that's all before, I suppose, the warehouse taxes, I suppose, uh, kick in in January 2023. So yeah, no, it's 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 a pity because it's a missed opportunity. Um, a little bit more leeway on those supports, you know, well into 2022 for the hotels that needed it most would have been very welcome. Yeah, I can imagine. Uh, can I turn to you, Cormac? Now, uh, just for, for for businesses generally, uh, were there any positives in the budget that they can look forward to? Thanks, Brian. Um, yeah, I think it's fair to say there were a number um, of positives there, in particular around the startup and SME side of things. Um, we saw a couple of positives, I think, coming from things that didn't change or didn't happen, um, and then a couple more from some extensions and enhancements to existing provisions. Um, so I suppose firstly, and probably most important for some companies is just to re-emphasize that the corporation tax rate of 12.5% hasn't changed for the vast or significant majority of Irish companies. Um, so that's a, certainly a positive for those businesses. Um, I think something else that didn't come up yesterday, I think that maybe went a little bit unnoticed um, was that there was no further indication given around the introduction of transfer pricing for SMEs. Um, so I suppose to slightly to step back in time, um, transfer pricing legislation was effective here from uh, 1 January 2020 um, in the mainstream. And one of the most significant provisions for Irish businesses was the proposed removal of the exemption from those transfer pricing provisions for SMEs. Okay. Um, and that would also have brought domestic transactions within scope. Um, so potentially that had a big impact or a potential impact for SME groups. Um, so if you had an Irish SME group, it would now have to benchmark all its intergroup transactions and hold significant documentation evidencing that. Um, that change was pending a ministerial order, which thankfully wasn't mentioned yesterday um, and doesn't seem to be on the immediate horizon. Okay. Um, so I think that was very welcome that that hasn't been implemented. Um, and, you know, it would appear to present, I'd say, relatively little benefit to the exchequer, in particular from those domestic transactions. Um, but it would have had a disproportionate impact on terms in terms of administration costs for those, those businesses. Um, so I suppose in terms of things then that did happen or change, um, we had an extension to the corporation tax exemption for startup companies um, and some enhancements to the Employment and Investment Incentive Scheme, the EIIS. That's extended um, out to five years now, is that right? Yeah, so the, these, uh, the startup company exemption, um, which I suppose for anyone not familiar with it, provided a newly incorporated company starting a new business um, could be exempt from corporation tax up to a value of 40,000 in tax per year for the first three years. So that's now extended that it's available for five years. And also the scheme has been pushed out to the end of 2026 in terms of new businesses starting. Um, so, so that's a welcome, um, a welcome enhancement to that scheme. Um, and maybe just on the EIIS also, um, there's been, uh, they've proposed to make some changes to the administration of that. Um, one of which for anyone that was familiar was that there was an obligation to have spent or have committed to spend at least 30% of the funds raised before you could go and issue the tax relief certs to your investors. And um, so that's going to be relaxed. And also some of the restrictions around redemption for the investors under penalty that, that they're going to be changed or removed. Um, and there was a suggestion that the, the, the ability of certain investment funds to invest in, in EIIS qualifying companies is going to be broadened. So I think some welcome developments on that front in terms of the businesses themselves. Um, and maybe just a final word, I think on 
I suppose that's on the business side in terms of the investors or the business owners. Um, you know, we saw no change to the CGT rate um, or to the entrepreneur relief scheme, the, the reduced 10% rate. And I think in some ways that can be seen as a positive, um, yeah. given that the entrepreneur relief scheme has survived and, and hasn't changed. Um, but I suppose there's probably a little bit of disappointment there that there wasn't a maybe a reduction or that there wasn't a reduction in the CGT rates generally um, that maybe would have given you know, further incentive or ability for investors or business owners to dispose of their businesses. Like, yeah, as Aiden, as Aiden a bit mentioned. of commercial activity. Yeah. Exactly, yeah, yeah. Very good. Um, Lisa, I, I, I just noticed from some of the commentators uh, over, the, over the last 24 hours, there seemed to be a general disappointment in relation to um, any provisions in relation to climate action uh, that has been uh, low, but there has been some incentives for buying electric vehicles. Is that right? Mm -hmm, absolutely, Brian. Again, this is another, I think, uh, welcomed extension of an existing relief for uh, for businesses that are providing vehicles to their employees um, so in in 2018 and um, they introduced an exemption from benefit and kind where an employer would provide an electric vehicle to um to their employee and this was due to expire at the end of 2022, but it's now been extended out to, to 2025. Now, there will be some tapering of that relief, but it, it, it's still a hugely beneficial relief because at the, at the moment, until the end of 22, a vehicle up to the value of 50,000 could be provided, um, an electric vehicle that is, um, without any BIK. And that actually represents um, a a net salary saving to an individual of 600 odd euros per month. As I say, it will be tapered down, but uh, for say 2023, 20, you could still be looking at 450 euros per month of a saving. And 24, it's 260 euros. And in 25, it's 130 euros. So substantial savings to be had there. And also obviously encouraging people to, to go green and, and, and you know, try and um, put a, some headway into, into climate action control. Indeed, yeah. It seems counterintuitive to be reducing the the, uh, the benefits available, <laughs> but I think he predicated that on the basis that he expects the, the, the cost of electric vehicles to be reduced yes. um, over the next couple of years, yeah, uh, which obviously remains to be seen. Um, Cormac, we've seen a lot of negative comments about the 15% rate for multinationals. Is this likely to have a big impact on, on local businesses who rely on these companies for their income? Yeah, I mean, I think the positive aspect of all of the commentary in the discussion around the 15% rate is that the vast majority um, of Irish businesses, as I said, will see no immediate impact on their tax position. Um, like as these provisions, they really only apply to a, a very, very small percentage of businesses in Ireland. Um, I think for context, Brian and everyone, like the, this change in terms of the tax rate comes about from Ireland's agreement to the OECD BEPS 2.0 initiative. Um, but the 15% rate is only one part of that. Um, so it was split into two pillars. Um, you know, pillar one was looking at how, uh, how profits should be allocated, um, which was largely based on consumer location rather than the location of the business. So it was almost like corporation tax partly becoming a consumer consumption focused tax. Um, but that provision only applies to businesses with a group um, global income of over 20 billion. Um, okay. So huge numbers. Um, yeah. And the second pillar, which was what introduced the 15% rate, um, that only applies to multinationals or corporations with a global group income of over 750 million. Yeah. So it's all very focused on the very largest businesses globally. So I think it is fair to say that there'll be no direct impact for the majority of Irish businesses or employees in terms of the actual tax they'll pay. But I suppose just the, the, the cautionary note to, at the end is that, and, and this is something I'm sure Jim will look at and uh, is better placed uh, than me to discuss, was is the, the possible negative macro impact um, of those provisions, um, you know, with, with that potential impact coming from probably more from pillar one than pillar two, as a lot of commentators have said, well, if the rate's going up, how is our, how is our tax take potentially going down? Um, and I think that it, it's maybe there where we might see a knock on to the Irish businesses that maybe support th those larger multinationals um, that, that there's potentially some negative there. Indeed. 
and I mean, while the, while the, it's a smaller number of companies, I think they, there's a, a mention uh, in in uh, Pascal Donahue's speech last week that it was around 1,500 companies that it would actually impact. Obviously, they would have um, a, a, a knock-on effect for other, uh, you know, uh, companies in in Ireland who service those companies, and and I think there's a, a relationship between the number of jobs that they uh, create in Ireland uh, with with the support jobs also. But Lisa, you had some interesting feedback on 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 the 15 percent recently. Is there anything you think that could have been done to counteract the effect of the increased corporation tax rate? Um, yeah, I mean, like after um, corporation tax, you know, one of the largest expenses for these multinationals is, you know, labour costs. And um, sitting alongside that is obviously, um, you know, employers, PRSI and say social security costs. Um, I was working with a, a large multinational recently where they were evaluating the uh, PRSI uh, employer charge across various different EU countries. And, you know, what they thought positively about our system is that it's quite easy to understand. But a negative that they had uh, mentioned was the fact that we don't have a ceiling. Um, so, you know, there's no cap on the amount of employer PRSI that these organisations or indeed SMEs would pay. Um, and I think, you know, it, it's very positive the PRSI didn't go up because there was obviously that risk that that could have happened also. But I think, you know, it might be something to look at over the next while as to whether we might introduce some sort of ceiling, which would make us that little bit more attractive uh, for FDI into, into Ireland in the future, which could, you know, counteract the effect potentially of this, uh, this change of corporation tax. Yeah, yeah, and I think ultimately, you know, the worry is that that uh, the changes may have some impact on future uh, FDI rather than mm -hmm. the current existing FDI. But you know, that's something that remains to be seen. Absolutely. Um, so thanks, uh, Lisa Cormac and Aidan, for your comments. I might take the uh, opportunity now to welcome Jim to join us for a commentary on his perspective of the budget 2022 and an insight into the economic implication for the country. Jim Power is an independent economic uh, financial consultant and owner of Jim Power Economics Limited, which he set up in 2009. He's a graduate of UCD and holds a BA and Master's in Economic Science. He lectures on the full-time MBA at a Smurfit Business School and uh, was previously Treasury Economist at AIB uh, from 87 to 91. He then jumped ship to the opposition where he served as Chief Economist of Bank of Ireland from 92 to 2000 and subsequently was Chief Economist at Friends First from 2000 and, uh, to 2018. He's a board member of Love Irish Food. Um, in February 2021, Jim and Chris Johns launched their uh, podcast, The Other Hand, which is on uh, available on Apple Podcasts and Spotify. That's the promised plug, Jim. Oh, uh, like uh, like our, our managing partner, Nisha Cosgrove, Jim is a native of Waterford, so he must be a good guy. Jim, I'll hand over to you. Okay, uh, thank you very much, Brian. I'm delighted to be here this morning for Crow. I am going to share a presentation, and as Brian said in the introduction, I would be, um, if anybody wants the presentation, it can certainly be held out afterwards. Okay. Um, what I what I want to do, I mean, you've you've heard from the panelists uh, a discussion on the some of the, the main tax aspects, particularly of the budget yesterday. So I want to sort of set the macroeconomic context. I'm going to talk about what's happening at a global level. I'm going to talk about what's happening the domestic economy, the public finances, and then give you a perspective on the implications of the budget. Um, the the last 18 months have obviously been absolutely extraordinary on so many different levels. When you see large swathes of the global economy effectively being shut down, um, it's a pretty unusual situation. And of course, as was always going to be the case, as the virus was being brought under control, thanks to a very successful vaccination program in many countries, we're seeing global economic activity being opened up, we're seeing a strong rebound. And of course, there are always negative side effects. And one of the negative side effects is definitely we are seeing this unleashing of very strong demand across the global economy. Unfortunately, during the period of lockdown at uh, the supply side of the global economy, um, you know, was put on hold in many ways. So we're now seeing really strong demand been met by significant supply side shortages. And this certainly feeds into 
that whole question about the cost of living in this country and indeed the cost of doing business. Uh, we're seeing commodity prices across the board rising very strongly. Um, and it's all commodities, it's construction material, um, it's grain, it's, it's food broadly. Um, and of course, and most pertinently, it's energy. And it has been significantly highlighted over the last few weeks what's happening on the gas price front, for example, for a variety of factors. And indeed, if you were to look at the gas situation as a proxy for what's going on, it really is a perfect storm. So many negative factors have come together at just the wrong time to create this serious upward pressure. And that, of course, is feeding true to higher inflation and other issues. There's CO2 shortages, for example. And indeed, we saw the UK government in the last few weeks bailing out a fertilizer plant because one of the um, byproducts of the production of fertilizer is CO2. So CO2 is necessary for food production, for drink production. Um, in the medical sector and so on. Uh, there's shipping chaos around the world. Um, and as a consequence of that, we're seeing container costs rise very, very strongly. And there are all sorts of horror stories about flotillas of cargo ships, if flotilla is the correct word, I'm not sure, off the coast of California at the moment, waiting to enter Californian ports. We've seen the cost of containers triple triple over the last six months or so. And of course, if container costs and shipping costs are rising, that will clearly feed through to higher prices across the board. Uh, we've seen a significant shortage of semiconductors. And of course, in the motor industry, the semiconductor is an integral part at this stage. But in many other manufacturing processes, semiconductors are vital. So there's a problem there, construction materials, packaging, labor. So a lot of supply side pressures at the moment, these bottlenecks are causing serious problems. And indeed, uh, last week, the front page headline on The Economist magazine was the shortage economy. And um, this is happening for a few reasons. One is, you know, supply was put on hold in many areas during the COVID lockdown. And now we're seeing very strong demand coming up against that limited supply and lots of supply side pressures emerging. We hope that you know, the next six months will see those supply side problems starting to abate. Um, and then you know, eventually in 2022, we start to return to normality. But it is important, I think, to understand, particularly from an Irish perspective, those global developments and how they impact on um, life and particularly economic life here in Ireland. On the interest rate front, uh, we have lived through for over a decade at this stage, a period of incredibly low interest rates. Uh, prior to COVID-19, US rates were starting to rise modestly. And the expectation was that the European Central Bank would start to increase rates. And then, of course, COVID hit. We saw a very strong response from central banks. Interest rates were taken down to zero virtually everywhere. We saw massive quantitative easing. In other words, central banks pumping money into the financial system to try and reignite and support economic activity. Um, we're at a stage now where central banks generally um, are quite, quite relaxed. They see this inflation problem that's becoming very evident um, as a temporary phenomenon, transitional, and that eventually in six to 12 months down the road, you know, those once off price pressures will abate and we then return to a normal situation. Unfortunately, um, as we go from week to week, those transitory inflationary problems, uh, the transitory bit seems to be lengthening somewhat. So central banks starting to get a little bit nervous. And um, the view from the United States is that interest rates could start to gradually tighten in 2022. There is no pressure whatsoever on the European Central Bank and as a consequence on Irish rates at the moment. But I would caution we do need to watch the evolution of inflation over the coming months. And if central banks, and I stress 
they are not there yet. But if central banks start to believe that inflation is going to start becoming embedded in the psychology of consumers and businesses, well, that's when they start to tighten interest rates. But I, at this point in time, I would say the very low interest rate environment in Ireland and in the euro area you know, will persist probably into 2023. But I stress, just watch the evolution of inflation. Um, looking at the Irish economic story, uh, you know, the and, and this came across very strongly, I think, in Pascal Donoghue's speech, particularly yesterday, just the nature of the recovery we've seen in the Irish economy over the last six months has been quite phenomenal. And all of the growth statistics we look at, many of the metrics for so far in 2021 are incredibly positive, despite the fact that in the first half of the year, many parts of the economy were subject to significant res um, restrictions. So as the economy has opened up, we're seeing a very strong rebound in economic activity. Um, I would stress in any discussion of the Irish economy over the last 18 months, it is very much a dual economy in terms of business performance. And it is certainly a dual economy in terms of employee experience. If you work in foreign direct investment, professional services, the public sector, or financial services, financially, the last 18 months have been fine. You've continued to work, you've continued to earn. Whereas if you work in hospitality, non-essential retail, the airline industry, and many areas of personal services. These are the sectors that were most subject to restrictions. Um, they've experienced very, very difficult times. Um, so it's very much a dual economy story. Uh, the labor market is improving, and indeed, uh, labor shortages are starting to emerge in some sectors, particularly in the hospitality area. So that's a, a, an important issue. Um, I'm going to bombard you with a few trace statistics in a second, but suffice to say that Brexit is having a very significant impact in the United Kingdom and is also having a significant impact here, particularly in terms of the supply chain. And I'll, I'll reiterate, I'll talk a little bit more about that in a second. We are seeing a very strong rebound in consumer spending. And what we saw during the 18 months of lockdown really was that in those sectors that continue to perform strongly, the workforce continued to earn, but the ability to spend was seriously restricted. And as a consequence, by the end of July, savings, household savings reached 134 billion, which is the highest level of savings we have ever seen in this country. And they fell back a little bit in August, but we're still talking about an elevated level of savings. And indeed, the central bank estimates that excess savings as a result of COVID, about 16 billion. And of course, what that now means is that those savings are going to come back into the economy. And hence, we're seeing a very strong rebound in consumer spending. Uh, but I, I guess the thing to really understand about Ireland at the moment, despite the aggregate statistics, there is very much an element of dual economy. This is what's happening in consumer confidence. And you can see out there on the right hand side, as the economy has reopened, consumer confidence rebounding very strongly. And indeed, this is reflected also in business confidence. And I was interested in the survey results that Brian conducted earlier just to show uh, or to demonstrate the level of optimism on the business front as well. Uh, this is a breakdown of exports in the first seven months of the year because Brexit obviously is a really important issue. So we can see there that exports, and I strip out Northern Ireland because we cannot at the moment in assessing the impact of Brexit consider the United Kingdom because of the Northern Ireland protocol, the North situation is very different. But you can see there that Ireland's exports to Great Britain increased by 25.7% in the first seven months of the year. That would suggest that the Brexit impact um, has not happened, that there's been no impact. So the exports up by 25.7%, but, and uh, when I teach economics, one of the things I always like to hammer home to students 
is the need to get beneath, interpret the statistics. And, and this really is a case in point. Um, chemical and pharma exports up 63%. I have no idea actually what's happening there. There is some technical reason for that, but very strong chemical and pharma performance. But then you look at food and live animal exports down by 5%. And we would have always argued that the agri-food sector was the sector most exposed to Brexit. That indeed is the case. On the other hand, trade with Northern Ireland in both directions, thanks to the Northern Ireland Protocol, is performing very, very strongly. Um, if you look at the other side of the equation, imports from the United Kingdom down by 31.7%, with food and live animal imports down 48.8%. Uh, and that's why we see on our supermarket shelves the lack of a lot of products that we would have seen in the past. They're just having serious difficulty um, sourcing from the United Kingdom. So the bottom line is Brexit is seriously complicating trade in both directions um, with uh, Great Britain particularly, but I suppose broadly speaking with the United Kingdom, the agri-food sector most impacted. But I think for any business dealing with the UK, it has become much more bureaucratic and difficult and uncertain. Uh, but the impact here pales into insignificance beside the chaos that is creating that is being created in the UK. We've seen serious stories about HGV shortages and so HGV driver shortages and so on. But looking at the pure trade piece, in the first seven months of the year, EU exports to the UK up by 6.2%, whereas EU imports from the UK down by 17.1%. So Brexit is impacting the UK economy very, very negatively. Looking at budget 2022, I've tried to set the economic backdrop, economy bouncing back strongly, the public finances turning out much stronger than expected. And indeed, this year, we're now projecting a deficit of 13.2 billion. A year yesterday in budget 21, the government was forecasting a deficit of 20.2 billion. So over a two year period, um, 20 and 21, a deficit of 35 billion in total had been projected. Um, and that's likely to turn out now at about 21 billion. So a 40% improvement. And I'll explain in a second why that's happening. The, cheat, the key challenges here in setting the budget, restoring order to the public finances, that dual economy piece, very strong multinational performance, indigenous SMEs in many sectors struggling, waning the economy off COVID supports, housing is clearly the biggest economic and social issue. And from, you know, the next general election will be fought on the battleground of housing. I think there's no doubt about that. Climate change, the OECD corporation tax changes that Cormac spoke about earlier and Lisa, labor shortages. Um, and that's why in some sectors, as I mentioned, labor shortages. So that's why, you know, we had an emphasis on a childcare package yesterday to try and improve labor supply. And of course, cost of living pressures, which ties back to that first global slide I showed you about the supply side problems and how that was resulting in inflation. This is the trajectory of tax revenues uh, going back to 1984. And you can just see, you know, over the last five years, there's been dramatic growth in tax revenues. This is the other side of the equation, the spending side. Uh, the blue line is gross current government spending. The red line is gross capital spending. And you can see there on the current side, particularly out on the right hand side of that, a very strong upward trajectory. This is what's happening on the tax revenue front. And I always feel that if you really want to understand what's happening in the economy, look at what's happening on the tax side because there is no greater manifestation of economic activity than taxation. And last year, or sorry, the first nine months of this year, very similar story last year, not as pronounced, but in the first nine months of the year, we collected almost 46 billion, um, up almost 15.9% on the same period last year. And three of those tax headings, income tax, 
VAT and corporation tax account for 84% of total tax revenues. So it's what's happening in those three tax headings that really dictates what's happening on the revenue side of the public finances. Income tax up by 19.5%. That's despite the fact that we had hundreds of thousands of workers in receipt of PUP in the first six months of the year. What's happening? Well, quite simply, those workers in those sectors least affected by COVID that I demonstrated earlier have continued to earn and have continued to pay tax. And that demonstrates the very progressive nature of our tax system. Low paid workers here pay very low levels of income tax. And it was low paid workers that were most adversely affected by COVID restrictions. So that's indicative of the labor market and the progressive nature of our income tax system. The VAT take up 26%, that reflects the strong rebound in consumer spending, particularly cars, new car sales, which are up 19% in the first nine months of the year. And the third piece then is the corporation tax side, um, up by 7.9%, 8 billion. Okay, and then you can see the other headings, um, which I won't. These are the economic assumptions underlying the budget. Um, I'm not going to bombard you with statistics this morning. A couple of things that stand out. Okay, GDP growth reasonably strong, but GDP is not a great measure of what's happening in the Irish economy. We have two other measures called, and statistical nerds would enjoy this stuff, modified domestic demand and modified gross national income. They are measures of what's happening in the indigenous economy, you know, stripping out a lot of the nebulous tax-driven multinational stuff. So we're looking at a pretty decent economic outlook out to 2025. Um, the other, there's a couple of other pieces that stand out, remarkable improvement in the labor market. Um, and we're looking at pre-COVID levels of employment and unemployment being achieved during 2022, which is a remarkable performance. The other piece that's interesting is the inflation side. And certainly the official forecasting agencies are reflecting the fact they believe that the inflation problem is transitory rather than permanent. Um, and as I discussed earlier, that is the global view of central bankers at the moment, uh, but it does remain to be seen. These are the fiscal assumptions and ba basically what we're going to see happen over the next few years is uh, um, an improvement in our public finances and in our level of government debt expressed as a percentage of gross national income. That's the bottom line, 106.2% this year, falling to 89.5% by 2025. However, I would stress that that improvement in the public finances is due to GDP growth, so our GNI growth, whatever measure of economic activity you want to look at. So the economy, the size of the cake is growing and of course, debt is measured as a percentage of that cake. So the cake is getting bigger. Secondly, tax revenues are projected to go from around 64, 65 billion this year to over 80 billion by 2025. So very strong growth in tax revenues. But the other, so those are the two reasons the public finances are improving. The third factor is an important one that public spending is expected to continue growing out to 24, 25. So the improvement in the public finances is due to growth and tax revenues rather than any attempt to control public spending. And that does worry me because, you know, I, I do believe that the quality of public spending rather than the quantity is what we should be focusing on. So it does concern me that we just continue to ratchet up public spending on an ongoing basis. And you'd question, you know, what are we getting in return? The key measures, 4.7 billion package, 4.2 billion of that was expenditure. Um, and a lot of that expenditure was on demographic stuff that had been built in pre-budget of new spending measures yesterday, about 1.45 billion. Okay, and we saw that being spread across social welfare and many other parts of the whole public sector. The taxation package, 500 million reduction net, but that included 
Uh, and the main measures there that were described were the indexation of the tax bans and allowances. Um, there was a 230 million tax raising package, mainly the carbon tax increase 750 per ton, and also the 50 cents on cigarettes. Uh, indexation tax bans and allowances, childcare packages, significant climate change, housing, the business supports, the EWSS has been extended and is going to be tapered down. I think that's really important for SMEs in the most vulnerable sectors. Uh, the detail remains to be seen. The commercial rates waiver has been extended. Uh, a very significant social welfare package. So I guess in the circumstances, you could describe it as an appropriate budget. Um, but I, I, because it addresses a lot of different areas, but I do worry about the whole scattergun approach. Um, I would prefer to see lumps of money being targeted at specific problem areas rather than just being spread across so many different things. But I would say that as an economist, wouldn't I? Um, I'm not a politician seeking re-election. So I guess every budget, but I think particularly yesterday's budget has to be seen in the context of a seriously politically motivated budget. Um, and this is the commercial for the podcast. If you want to hear this stuff ranting for a couple of times a week, uh, please be my guest. So I'll finish there, Brian. It's a quick run through of you know how I view the whole macroeconomic context of the budget and the impact. So thank you very much for your attention. Thanks for that, Jim. Um, I think uh, there was a lot in that to be taken in, and, and I, I think uh, it'll be uh, no harm to have a, a quick review of those slides again uh, as we go through. But as you mentioned, uh, the political scene, I think it's, it's, um, it's probably interesting to note that while the projections that you, you, you showed us uh, out to 2025 um, uh, may may uh, be what the current administration plan they of course may not be there uh, to see that through but uh, that's another another uh, uh, situation so um in terms of our q and a's uh, we have a couple of questions in uh, uh, one for you Jim how does the budget we heard yesterday fit in with the national development plan which was published last week okay the national development plan last week 165 billion um, of investment out to 2030 uh, lots of different projects in there um and, and you'd have to say at the, at the end of by 2030 if all of that stuff is delivered or is on the way to being delivered um it'll really enhance our economy and our quality of life but obviously that remains to be seen what we saw yesterday was the capital allocation in the budget was totally consistent with uh the rollout of the national development plan so the budget definitely consistent i guess some of the concerns i would have about the national development plan is number one um construction cost inflation which is a big big issue yes. secondly it's the capacity of our economy to actually deliver the the, the, the construction output particularly that is required because uh, there are battle bottlenecks already so it is definitely going to be a challenge in having the capacity to deliver what needs to be delivered and a third part that's really important is that there is a public spending code that tries to um, impose cost benefit analysis on all public spending to make sure the taxpayer gets the best possible value for money. One of the change, and that code has been in place, the current code since 2015. But one of the changes included in the National Development Plan was to bring carbon accounting into it. So for every project now, you consider the Cork to Limerick Road. Um, you know, on a cost benefit analysis, it's the cost of building it and CPO, all that stuff against the benefits that it would accrue in terms of time saved and promoting business, et cetera. But now we're also going to have to include carbon accounting. So you're going to have to include in the costs, the emissions created during the construction of the road. And also, and this is where it gets really tricky the emissions that will result from the increased traffic use of that road down the road. So my fear would be that if you build in the carbon costs of those projects, the cost benefit analysis mm -hmm. will look a lot different. So many of those projects may actually never see the light of day. That's the challenge. Of course. Yeah. And I suppose, um, 
to a certain extent, uh, while you mentioned housing will certainly be a, a feature of the next election, I presume the climate change uh, agenda will also uh, be very significant on that. Yeah, well, Brian, w- one of the interesting things there, if I may interject, there, there was a, an opinion poll in the Irish Times, MRBI Ipsos opinion poll last Friday, which showed massive voter opposition to climate change measures. The only one that saw support was building wind farms on land. And the obvious reason for that is that it doesn't affect most people. Unless you're living beside it, it's not going to affect you. So what we're seeing on the climate agenda is very much we're in favor of addressing climate change as long as it doesn't personally affect me. So politically, it's going to be challenging. It sure will. It sure will. We have another question in from from Jerry Riley. Uh, Jim, could you comment on the uh, asset on ECB balance sheet represented by government debt instruments? As the ECB is owned by European government citizens, surely our position uh, on this should be deducted from our national debt. In other words, it's notional non-existent debt. Is that... Yeah, I mean, we, 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 we have assets and our net debt situation is about 20% better than the gross debt situation um, suggests, okay? But I, I was throwing out the gross debt, which I actually think is a better measure of the situation because of course, if you don't control gross debt, uh, it's very difficult to control net debt. The um, ECB's balance sheet has been expanded dramatically by the European Central Bank buying government bonds um, from the banking system in every EU member country and indeed around the world at the moment because of COVID. This is a very unusual situation and the big problem for central banks over the next few years will be to unwind that monetary support that's been given to the system. I mean, I I guess um, my overall, my overriding concern with the public finances would be you know, as I demonstrated there, or as I spoke about, public spending is just set on a very strong upper trajectory as far out as we can see. Um, and, and that does pose a risk because, number one, the cost of borrowing is very low at the moment. It will rise. And yeah. secondly, as we found back in 2010, if international investors lose confidence in an economy, you have a serious problem funding that debt. So... Debt is a vulnerability, and I just don't buy the notion that some have that debt doesn't matter. Debt does matter, particularly for a small open economy like Ireland. Indeed. Yeah, yeah. Now, we have another question in which I might throw over to, to uh, my partners, and, and, and um, obviously uh, uh, whoever knows about this may be able to answer. Uh, the minimum price on drink uh, order is due in, uh, to come in in January next. Is it true that whilst the price uh, of drink is going up considerably, the government gets none of this? The drink companies get to keep it? Aidan, maybe I'll be able to. Aidan, I think you're on mute there. Yeah, I'm afraid no. That's not something that's uh, I can I can address at this stage. Yeah, so one we look into and maybe come back to people. Okay, very good. Um, and then one again again for Jim, which is uh, is the budget sensible in the context of the corporate tax changes which will arise from us signing up to the OECD OECD agreement? Okay, I, I'll answer that question in a second. If I may come in, and I know Aidan, you're going to get back with more detail, but the minimum unit pricing is is what it says. It's setting a minimum price for a unit of alcohol it will not affect drink prices in pubs or hotels it will affect drink prices in supermarkets and in off licenses and it is not a tax it's a minimum price so the rev the the extra revenue will go to the um the businesses that's my understanding in terms of the corporation tax challenge um i didn't mention my presentation but i I was looking at there's, there's loads of five-year projections for absolutely everything contained in the budget documentation. And I was just looking at the corporation tax profile. We collected 11.8 billion last year, which was a record high. This year, we're going to collect around 13.8 billion, which obviously is another record high. But by 2025, and if you accept that in the middle of that in 2023, last week's changes, the OECD BEPS-driven changes will be implemented in some form. And I don't think it's clear. I'm not a tax expert, but I think because of what's happening in US Congress and the EU transposition of the agreement into EU 
tax law. We still don't know what it's eventually going to look like, but one assumes that in 2023, some of those changes will be implemented. And I'll then look at in 2025, the Department of Finance is forecasting corporate tax revenues in excess of 15 billion. So the Department of Finance view is very much that it's not going to push Irish corporation tax receipts off the cliff edge. Okay, um, they expect corporation tax to continue to grow. But of course, it's probably the case that if these changes weren't implemented, perhaps that figure would have been at 17 rather than 15. Of but course. it's not going to create a hole in the public finances. And in fact, um, as an economist looking in at it without understanding the tax intricacies of it, it does strike me that the impact of this on Ireland will be very, very limited. Uh, but and, and I actually think there's a real positive out of it because it is, it is going to undermine to some extent our relative tax position. So what we have now got to do, in my view, is to focus on all of those other elements that make Ireland attractive for foreign direct investment. So it's infrastructure, it's the IT capability, it's public services like health and education, it's the quality and supply of housing and the price of housing, um, and also education, the quality of the workforce. So all of that stuff, I think, is going to become much more important for Ireland to focus on if we want to remain the um, FDI location that we are at the moment. Um, so I, I'm relatively sanguine, relaxed about it, but Very good. obviously it's one we need to watch. Indeed, I see some commentators actually saying that it might have in, indeed have a positive effect. Yeah. Um, that's it. Now, uh, we've, we've come uh, to the end of our time. Uh, I'd like to thank everybody uh, in, uh, who, for attending this morning. I'd like to thank uh, our panellists this morning, our, our, my fellow partners, and in particular uh, Jim Power for giving us the time this morning uh, to give us an, in, uh, an insight into the public finances and, and uh, the projections that are coming down the line. And uh, hopefully we will see you all as clients uh, in, in the near future. And thank you for attending. Thanks very much. Thank you very much, Brian.